Glad you could join us for Medicaid Monday. This is our law firm, Pierre O'Connor and Strauss. We practice in all of those areas on the bottom of the screen. We are a law firm that's specialized in elder law, estate planning, business succession planning, corporate special needs planning. And these are the attorneys that work in all of those areas for the firm. We have offices in, in New York City and in Albany primarily, but we have satellites around New York State and in other states as well. So experts in navigating care, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Susan Vale. Hello. Hello, Susan. And Susan is with Everhome Care Advisors, a group that we are very closely affiliated with that provides life care coordination services. And Susan will talk a little bit about what that entails and the types of work that Everhome does. <clears throat> Today's agenda, Medicaid by the numbers, quick review, updates on home care assessments, because this is really where the action is in many of the home care applications, how to advocate for hours and some success stories that we have, immediate needs procedures, if you can't wait the four to six months to get the full assessment done, and the impact that staffing shortages is having on all of our types of care and the necessity of really using creative planning to find the assistance, to find the home health care aides that can staff a case when it is Medicaid financed. And Frank, bring us through the numbers. All right, so it's a new month, same numbers as we've done the last few times now. So again, if you hadn't heard, we did see slight increases now for 2024. So if you're a single person at home, your monthly income allowance went up for, for $55 from last year to this year. So now you have an income allowance of $17.52 per month. If you're a couple at home, that's now up to $23.71. So up $83 from last year. And then if you're a community spouse, meaning you're at home, you don't need services, but your spouse does, whether it's at home or in a nursing home, your community spouse income allowance went up to $3,853.50, up $138 from last year. Number that didn't change is the bottom one, which is if you're in a nursing home, your income remained at $50 per month, same number since 1965. And your asset numbers, again, went up just a little bit. So we saw an increase for resources for one person, up $993 from last year, up to $31,175. Couple at home, with they both need services went up from 40,821 up to 42,312 for this year. And again, that spouse, that community spouse resource allowance, the lower limit stayed right where it was at 74,820. Again, it's been sitting there for quite a while, so it's still there now. If you're writing furiously, <laughs> you will have access to the slides. We also publish a Medicaid guide, which it contains all of these numbers with explanation as to how they work how the Medicaid home care numbers work for individuals and couples and the nursing home rules for resource and income allowances. So that Medicaid guide is available at pierrolaw.com, P-I-E-R-R-O-L-A-W.com. Go to resources and you will find all of our guides on that website. So when we as elder law attorneys file a Medicaid application, it has a series of steps that are necessary. The first half, let's call it, are the financial and legal steps pre-planning for Medicaid qualification. And in our Medicaid Monday sessions, we cover the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, which is our primary tool to shelter assets. We cover pooled income trusts, which is our primary tool to shelter income. But once you get the assets sheltered, the income sheltered, you file your Medicaid application, that's when the second half begins. And the second half is a series of assessments that we're going to talk about today. And what we have found is that clients are uninitiated. There is a tremendous disincentive to award the appropriate numbers of hours. Uh, there was just an article in the Times Union yesterday about that very topic and a group that is not giving out the care that they need and cutting budgets to increase profits, a for-profit entity. This is what you face when you're applying for Medicaid. So having a guy, having someone who can advocate, someone who can actually be at the assessment, who can counsel on gathering up the necessary medical records for the immediate needs assessment is in our estimation, absolutely vital. And in our law firm, we had those people in-house for a period of time, and then it spun out into Everhome Care Advisors, and Susan was both in 
the firm and now yeah. with Everhome Care Advisors. So Susan, I'm gonna leave it to you to talk a little bit about ALCA and what aging life care professionals do. Aging Life Care Professionals is part of a national organization, the Aging Life Care Association. It is a group of individuals who are nurses, um, social workers, care managers that have to be vetted and um, are allowed to use that ALCA term. What sets us apart is we don't focus in one area. We have expertise in all different areas such as care, family, dealing with conflicts, when to tell you to go to an elder care attorney, advocacy, which I can't say enough. And as you can see, there are a variety of other services that we have expertise in. Yes. So we, when we don't have uh, coverage in our own capital region, which is really the reach of Ever Home Care Advisors, that we've had clients for through Ever Home that have been in Plattsburgh, in Lake Placid, uh, areas, Duchess, Ulster. But we also practice in New York City. We practice on Long Island. And when we do, we very often reach out to Alta to bring in care managers to work with in the Medicaid process, doing the initial assessment, determining the appropriateness of care. What program do you want to apply for? Is it consumer directed? Is it nursing home transition diversion waiver? Those are all nuances within the Medicaid system. And Frank, the NIA assessment is one of those new features that came in a couple of years ago. Yeah. So previous to NIA, this would all get done kind of through a group called Maximus and made contracted with New York State. And then ultimately, after you were done with your Maximus stuff, then you would go to your managed long-term care company or apply for your waiver. But then NIA got thrown in the middle of it. So NIA is this group that, again, works with New York State, where essentially the way that I think of it is it's NIA is a group of nurses or other health professionals that, that first conduct a community health assessment. So that, it, that, only deter, that only occurs after you've been financially approved for Medicaid. So you'll have your community health assessment done by a nurse, where then they assess a person's needs with the activities of daily living that they have. And then following that community health assessment, then a clinical appointment will be scheduled and the applicant for Medicaid will then be examined and gone through another assessment process with an independent either physician, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, you know, another medical professional. And then those entities kind of bring their information together and then they kind of further go down the pipeline into getting the care in place. But that's that's essentially who NIA is and who they are and what they do. And they're kind of the new cog that just came into kind of this giant uh, morass, if you will, of just the system just a few years ago. And I believe that NIA is actually the new Maximus, that Maximus took over this process. And instead of having it with different individuals, the original assessment was Maximus, and your own physician got to weigh in. Now you have independent physician, independent assessor, and then the managed long-term care company, which at the end of the day, makes the final determination of the number of hours. So when we're looking at paying for care, and this is the, the big ticket item, if you're 24 seven care and you're paying an agency $35 an hour, you're paying about $250,000 a year. If you need 16 hours, eight hours, do the math, and multiply it out. It's very difficult to find caregivers to work for the wage scale that Medicaid pays. So how do you deal with that when you're dealing with $17 an hour caregivers where they're making $25 to $30 working private pay? So private pay is one way that people usually begin this process, right? Yeah, I think it, when, when we deal with clients, if it's kind of a situation where the house is already on fire, so to speak, and care is needed now, most people don't walk in with no care in place. Usually they have some system set up. And most of the time when we ask, how's the care going and what's going on? It's, well, we found either these women or we found this group of people or, you know, somebody I know sent us, you know, through some contacts and we found these groups. But ultimately it's people are getting paid cash under the table to take care of mom or dad or both, just depending on the situation. But they usually know that that financial situation isn't sustainable long term because of the amount of cost associated with just paying cash out of their out of mom or dad's pocket, and they want to look at other options, and that's why we talk potentially about getting qualified for Medicaid. 
And if you have long-term care insurance, that plays into the private pay side of things because you're going to have a benefit. It may not be enough of a benefit to pay your entire care need. But one of the things that we just like to point out, because Susan's here, is that in many of those long-term care contracts, there is actually a care management or care coordination benefit that you can access before your days of elimination, that the days you have to wait to get a benefit can, mm -hmm. can come in. And Susan, that pays for you. Yes. <laughs> so that depending on the way the policy is written, you'll be able to access the pre-planning services to get ready for navigating through this because even navigating through a long-term care policy can be overwhelming, confusing, just like every other way, <laughs> every other thing in life. And Frank, we have different programs. We do. And, and you can't just shoot the shotgun. You have to have a rifle and you need to hit the appropriate target. <laughs> it's probably a good way to put it because in many instances, the, what program is going to be kind of, I don't want to say obvious, but it'd be pretty clear, I think, from the facts and circumstances. Like if, if people are coming to the table where they have caregivers already in place that they want to keep, well, then consumer directed personal assistance is the program that's going to let them keep them, assuming that that all works out and the caregivers are comfortable with going on in Medicaid's payroll. And they have a green card. And mm -hmm. yeah, they have documentation yes. and all the things that accompany that. Sometimes it's somebody needs more around the clock care for more like supervision due to cognitive deficit. That that would be much more likely that an HTD waiver might be more appropriate. Occasionally we deal with people who have a traumatic brain injury and they need assistance with other things like housing and uh, employment assistance and other things like that. So it's not always you know, one size fits all. It's just a matter of making sure that we get the client to the right program. And as Lou said, there are several. And sometimes people come in with disabilities that are from birth with developmental disabilities, and then you're in a whole separate set of rules. So just to point out that there are OPWDD right. programs or, and an OPWDD waiver that would apply, and that's office for people with developmental disabilities, that would apply to someone with that developmental disability that would cover the services that they need. Uh, so you have to really identify what program is going to be most appropriate for your client. And very often, Susan, that takes an assessment. Yes, it does. It does. Um, and that assessment is non-threatening um, in terms of if you contract or consult with Everhome, we will guide you. Um, we look at the holistic part of you your home, what are the, the setup? What's your normal daily activities? What do you need help with now? Is your home gonna be accessible? There's a long laundry list um, and that can be very overwhelming. And that's where we partner with you and your family to be able to be prepared for that moving on with Medicaid and the NIA because many times your family is caring for the person in need and it's very important and I'll go into this a little bit later that you don't say oh I Betty does this for me or I do this for my mother or father it has to be very clear of what those needs are and we can help guide you through that by having that initial assessment to prepare for that in-depth assessment that will occur when navigating Medicaid. So, Frank? So the, the different program, or some of the different programs, we've given a little more information on this slide. So we generally see people fall into somewhere in bullet number one, where they're going to a managed long-term care company and they're gonna seek either personal, uh, personal care services or consumer-directed personal assistance services. So the big hedge or the big uh, lever there is do you have caregivers already that you want to keep or do you, are you going to more rely on the agency model where a local agency will be providing the aids? But again, we do have the waiver programs like the NHTD waiver, the traumatic brain injury waiver. Or for other people, if you live in certain geographic areas, sometimes it makes more sense to look at the PACE program or the Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. So it's a much more of a bundled service where you have kind of a giant umbrella that wraps around someone in their care. The unfortunate part with PACE is it's just it's not available in all geographic areas. So that's a big, a big question of whether that's going to be appropriate or not. It's literally starting with where does this person live and what services they need. But again, when you bring in someone like Susan or 
a different care manager, that's another piece of information that they can help guide their clients through to see which one of these options is going to put their client in the best position possible. So how do you get the hours that you need? This is kind of the search for the holy grail. How do you go through the process to get more than four hours a day, which is kind of the standard out of the gate offer from a managed long-term care company to get 16 hours a day, which is what your doctor says you actually need. And Frank, just walk us quickly through this and then we'll get into some more detail. Sure. So the first one is once we get that Medicaid approval, the first one is going to be that independent assessment by, by NIA, right? They're going to come in. They're going to look at, you know, what do you need actually, or do you need a level of assistance necessary to qualify for the Medicaid program? This is not generally something that we're, that we're really worried about. How many have you had rejected? I don't think we've had any, but if, if we have, it's one or two. But this is becoming much more of a thing in general. Like we have heard other practitioners that have that are running into this issue. We just haven't really seen it as much. Um, but previous to Naya, I don't think we ever had heard either of one of our clients or or a similar person that was working with a colleague that didn't get through kind of that opening gate, if you will, to get to Medicaid. So now we have that independent assessment. Right. Once you get that for that community health assessment completed, then you have to go to your clinical appointment that's done with that independent physician. And then it depends. The next step kind of depends on how much care do you need. If you need more than 12 hours of assistance, then you your case actually goes before something called an independent review panel. And then they make their own recommendations as to the plan of care. And then ultimately, then you're going to be referred back to in most instances, you're a managed long-term care company, with which then they're going to take all that information. So your assessment information from your uh, community assessment, the doctor's visit, and the independent review panel's recommendations, and then they're going to award a number of hours. And that obviously takes some time for obvious reasons. You're asking several different groups of people all under kind of one umbrella to do many different things. So just like I think would make a lot of sense. We are seeing delays when it comes to all of these things on top of the disappointing results, which is that people aren't always just getting the care or the level of care that they think is appropriate. So if you think of, if you're a skier, or if you can imagine the Olympics, they have a downhill race where your path is clear, you're going straight down the hill versus a slalom where you have to meet certain gates and you have to get through the gates to get to the finish line. And Medicaid just seems to be setting up more and more and more gates to make people get through those gates and, and traverse it so that you get the care that you need and the hours that you need. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end about the appeals process because very often the initial offer, as we call it, is not the amount of time and the amount of hours that are actually needed. So getting through this process is some legal work, but it's also some care management work in educating the clients and in getting through this process in a way that the result is attainable. So step one, that's your community health assessment. So this is where you're gonna have that nurse uh, either come into the home or do a virtual visit. And they're gonna ask a whole bunch of stuff of what can you do, what can you not do, what do you need assistance with, and, and, how, and to what level of assistance do you need? Because there's a difference between saying, well, I need a little bit of help versus I need complete help. I cannot do any of this task. And the, the process normally takes a few hours. So we usually try to just give our clients the idea of this isn't going to be a half hour one and done kind of thing, but it's going to go through many different things, many different questions. And this is, I think, one of the main places where someone like Susan can come in and really do a lot of good for the applicant, because not only is a care manager going to be able to help prep the family as to the questions that's going to be asked, but it's also, but a care manager is also going to be able to make sure that accurate information is being given because we have heard stories in the past where these assessment and tasking tools don't get clear kind of windows into the actual task and what's being able to be accomplished. So for instance, one question could be, well, have you showered in the last three days, right? If the answer is no, which for many people, depending on circumstance, it might just be no, because they haven't had a shower in the past three days, they didn't need one. Well, there are times that on that tasking tool, just because that thing, that activity hasn't occurred, then sometimes people are scoring it as, then they don't need that help with that service. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the correct, the, the correct way of looking at it. If the person needs total assistance, if they were to shower, then that has to be communicated rather than, than just saying, oh, it hasn't occurred in that time period, they're fine, they don't need help. 
The one piece I will put into that when you're talking about the activities of daily living and what their ability is, that is truly based on their physical ability. When looking at uh, care through a uh, managed long-term care program, they are concentrating on the physical needs, not the cognitive. Yeah. If it were a cognitive, we would go more in depth and look into the nursing home diversion waiver. And that's always a sticking point for our family. So I just wanted to make note of that. And the ultimate preparation of the Medicaid application is preparing the case for a fair hearing. That's the administrative proceeding after you've exhausted all of your internal appeals that you get to. And at that point in time, even though you can't use the physician assessment, we very often bring in the treating physician and have them give an affidavit, what very often used to be called the M11Q, and have that task-based assessment done, which is meeting the Medicaid guidelines so that when you get to fair hearing, you can lay out your case and buttress it or fortify it with actual medical evidence. And the care coordinator is the one who typically goes about the process of interviewing, getting the physician information, getting the medical records, and preparing the case for that ultimate argument that you're gonna have and the advocacy that you're gonna need to get the care that you need. Step two. So this is, you're gonna to go to that independent physician, right? This is your clinical appointment. And it could be a doctor, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a physician assistant, physician's assistant, sorry. But it's somebody that's been contracted by NIA to complete kind of this medical review. And again, biggest change here is you're not using your doctor for this one or the, or the Medicaid applicant's doctor for this one. This is someone that they've never met. So this is another reason why we're seeing not only a downturn in the number of hours being offered, but this is also why it takes more time because scheduling has to take time because you've got to get on somebody's schedule that you've never met before. So there's a lot of just working and moving pieces with all of this that made this whole process take longer. And unfortunately, the results not as good as people were maybe even seeing prior to all this. So Frank, we're doing this in 30 minutes. How long does it take to get through a traditional Medicaid application and get to an award of hours and services turned on in the home? Unless you're doing immediate needs, it's usually between four to six months after everything that's required to do financial eligibility, get the application done, approved, and then do all of these things that we're talking about now, four to six months. So you have to prepare your clients. And if you are a client, you have to be prepared to go through this waiting process and all of these different assessments and all the work that you have to do to get to the end result. And then step three is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, if you, you need a lot of care, which a lot of people need a lot of care, right? Then you have this independent review panel that then takes everything that's happened already and just puts their own spin on it and, and puts more recommendations in for that plan of care of whether that person's gonna be able to remain safely at home or not. So again, just more people involved with the process. And if this all sounds like a lot, here's a graphical representation of this is everything that we're talking about. <laughs> And you don't really know how many hours you're going to get until that last MLTC interview. Right. Correct. Um, when you do the NIA assessments and the subsequent assessments, the evaluator might say, oh, I think you'll get this amount. Do not take that as the amount you're going to get. The only entity can, that will give you the hours that are authorized are the MLTC, and that takes time as well. So New York State budget proposals, okay. um, again, more gates. We have to ski a longer course. We have to you know, make gates way out, way out of our way, limit to people who can't direct their own care. That was one of the proposals, disqualifying people with Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive impairments. These are things that were, were roundly rejected by the one house bills from the legislature, but we have a, a legislative panel. If you want to get more information on this aspect of it, the New York State proposals and the budget. Join our Elder Law Forum, which is May 16th, and we'll give a little more information out on that, but you can find more information on purelaw.com. If your client has immediate needs, Frank, this is where we're really trying to fortify our case to get to the immediate needs standard. Yeah, so that four to six month window is just too long. For, for safety purposes, there is, the immediate, there is the ability to file what's called an immediate needs application. It does bring the processing time down to about 12 days from after it's been submitted to approval, assuming that all your correct documentation has been provided. 
this is another place where the actual treating physician gets to kind of get some input because there are paper, there is some paperwork that has to be completed by your treating physician. Uh, we did do a separate Medicaid Monday on immediate needs in the past. So if this is something that you want more information about, please go back and check that out. But again, we wanted to make sure that people are aware that given everything that we're talking about, if the length of time is too long, there still is the immediate needs process. But that does also now involve NIA because when NIA first came in, NIA wasn't doing the assessments for immediate needs. That is County's an HRA work. work. Right. So now that NIA is back in the game there. And Susan, this is where you need to gather up your medical evidence yes. to support the immediate needs application. Yes, and that is key. And it doesn't take away from the still person needing care. Often um, we've run into where they'll say we can't do because a person's in a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home. And that's where you need us to advocate and say, no, you, you are authorized and you can do this while they're in there that way. Because if they come out of the nursing home or the assisted living or wherever they are in that skilled nursing facility, they're going to need that care immediately. We can't wait six months, four months, 30 days, 10 days, five days, because there could be immediate harm. Yeah, there's a catch-22 because you, they tell you you can't get assessed until you're back home, but you can't get services until you're assessed, and you can't get back home until you've got services. So it's discharge planner's nightmare because they can't get the services on in the home that are necessary to care for someone. So getting this done early, getting the immediate needs application in and getting the interviews done is absolutely critical in terms of timing. Uh, and this is something we face, everyone faces. This is the holy grail, finding caregivers and getting the average, right? Yeah, more than anything, it's becoming harder and harder to keep people at home because of this. It's not that we can't qualify people for the benefits. It's that even if you're qualified, are there people going to be around and available to actually work the number of hours? That's the biggest issue that I'm seeing in my practice. And I think ultimately why we're seeing a lot more people having to go to immediately going to nursing homes, because while families want to keep people at home, if they can't find the caregivers to actually provide the care, people aren't staying at home and they're getting placed. And it's unfortunate, it's terrible, but that's, that's the reality. And having a professional, Susan, helps in that search. Yes, it does. Um, I know you guys are probably balking at these figures because, as Frank had alluded to, some people do pay under the table, but there's a whole set of risks, such as workman's comp and somebody being injured and suing you. Um, even with an agency trying to find care, they're short-staffed as well. In our capital region, it's about $35 an hour for agency level care. In New York City, I would say it varies depending on where the person is. And I would have you reach out to a care coordinator, an ALCA member to advocate for you and help guide you on that path. Um, it's the staffing crisis is throughout, no matter where you are, there, the care is not there. But we can look at other supports. We can look at a combination of services, looking at what time the care is needed. So there are ways we can work with you. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be the dream number of staff and the hours, but we have to make sure that your loved one's safe. And safe in all respects, mm -hmm. financially and from liability risk. And that can't be underestimated. Workers' comp, unemployment insurance, tax withholdings, all those things can get you into a raft of trouble with the federal government, the state government. So nursing homes are having issues, Frank. Yeah, we, we have heard uh, for a long time that like when you get to the weekend, there's just there's not a lot of staff on. So we have a lot of people that have loved ones in nursing homes that have to routinely go on the weekends to make sure that their loved ones' met, uh, needs are being met on the weekend because of staff shortages. And just like Susan said, right, it's everywhere. It's not just the capital district, it's all over. So unfortunately, we're seeing that kind of it's a it's kind of like a it's a, like a butterfly effect. We're not keeping people at home. So because we can't keep them at home, they have to be placed. But now that they're placed, they're also still not getting maybe as much care as they need because there aren't workers in the nursing homes that take care of them either. So it'll be interesting to see how this continues to build upon itself. Um, because again, financially, there's a lot of things we can do. But finding care, that's becoming the biggest problem 
whether it's at home or even in a facility. And if you're a professional at any of the related professions dealing with this area, you need to build a team. Having a competent elder law attorney, having a qualified care coordinator, and building the team around that individual so that all of their needs can be met to the extent possible with the future being looked to and Medicaid access to pay for as much of the care as it can pay for. And life care coordinators, care managers provide guidance and help. Families often hit this juncture where they just start pulling their hair out because they're at wit's end because there seems to be no solution. But when you have that team working for you, the solution can be brought in and the care can be found, paid for, and be sustainable, Frank. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's the best what, best chance you have is to make sure that you have qualified people to help every step of the way. And I think for many people, it's care managers and life care coordinators are kind of the missing piece to all of it that they didn't really know was there. But many, many, many people are very glad that they're involved once they are contracted to start helping. So the next Medicaid Monday is May 13th. We will be covering in depth the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And I'd like to just invite you all personally to come to the Elder Law Forum. It is going to be live here in Albany at the Desmond, and it will be virtual as well, anywhere that you sit in front of a computer or your phone. And we have some incredible speakers, a wonderful panel, the chairs of the Senate and Assembly Health Committees, uh, Rivera and Pollan. We have John McDonald, Jacob Ashby from the Assembly and the Senate locally, respectively. Uh, and we have representatives from virtually every agency and industry in long-term care. So it's a, it's a great day. I hope you can join us. And for those of you who are social workers, there are six continuing education units uh, that you will be given free of charge. And it is a, or I'm sorry, there is a charge for the CEUs, but there's no charge to attend the Elder Law Forum. And this is our 29th year. It's something that uh, has grown over the years, and we hope you can be part of it.